Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, welcome to another Yam Yam Retro Gaming live stream. Uh, bit of an unexpected one this, I was hoping to do it a bit later this week, but I really haven't been well the last couple of weeks, and uh, unfortunately I've had to spend quite a bit of time at home, so uh, not sleeping well, not feeling too good, I thought it would just be best if I just stay home and work on a few things that I need to do at home, rather than going to work and do what I need to do there. So um, anybody who follows my, my regular work of building arcade machines or doing things like that, um, I will be back on it very soon. Uh, I've just got to look after my health. So anyway, uh, Yam Yam Retro Gaming, today's live stream. Uh, the last few days I've been covering various other things, as people have seen. I've been covering a lot of things to do with the ZX Spectrum Next. If you haven't already checked out those videos, I recommend you go and check those out now because there's some awesome games to be seen on that upcoming system i've got I had exclusive coverage of the baggers in space latest release and also of the latest release of warhawk for the spectrum next and i've also been covering um spectrum games uh, last releases and giving you news on upcoming release i'll be covering from them called montana mike uh, pretty soon i'll be able to cover that in detail but today, um, I've got something a bit different. Um, the other day, I was looking at flash cards for the Amstrad GX4000, which is not a system everyone's familiar with. And today, we're going to be looking at a favourite of a lot of people from the sixth generation. We're looking at the Sega Dreamcast. So... Uh, I apologise because for some reason my gimbal's not working, so you might have to put it with a little bit of shaky cam, I'm afraid. But I'm going to try and cover this as best I can with my shaky hands. <laughs> so, um, the Sega Dreamcast, obviously released in, um, was it 1999, I think? The very back end of the millennium, uh, and it was, unfortunately, Sega's one song. Um, a great little system um, that's maintained kind of a cult following today. It was Sega's last entry into the console game. And it's been a great system, you know. Uh, unfortunately, it was overshadowed um, due to some choices on Sega's part, mainly not including DVD support at a time when DVDs were becoming extremely popular and their main competitor, uh, Sony, was coming up with the PS2. Once the PS2 arrived, it just pretty much blew everything else out of the water. It only had a very short lifespan of perhaps 18 months, two years tops, where people were still buying it, playing it, and developing games for it uh, before it bit the dust and Sega exited the console market, sadly. Um, it's not a bad system. It has its flaws. I was a big Nintendo fan back in the day, um, and unfortunately I missed out on this system because obviously as consoles got more expensive, I couldn't afford more than one system at a time and I was down the Sony path at that point. So the Dreamcast uh, passed me by. Uh, friends still had Nintendo 64s. They weren't eagerly anticipating the GameCube. Everybody was getting the PS2. The PS2 just demonstrated how the sixth generation should be done. But this was probably the last console that really you know, went with the ethos of doing bringing the arcade experience home. You know. It didn't really work well with the Saturn, but the hardware that's contained inside a Dreamcast is pretty much identical to Sega's Naomi arcade hardware, which at the time was kind of giving the last brilliant flourish of classic arcade gaming, you know, in the arcades themselves. Beautiful candy candy cabs, um, you know, a lot of influence from Japan and um you know, it was ported well uh, to bring into a home console. To be able to condense the arcade hardware into a little box like this was brilliant, which was smaller than the PlayStation 2, much smaller than the Xbox, which obviously was a couple of years off just at that point. Um, but yeah, it was just an, an all-round great system. Good stuff, Tony. <laughs> yeah, there was some weird peripherals for this system. It was one of the last consoles to get, you know, proper light guns intended to be used with CRTs. Uh, it was one of the last, it had um, all kinds of peripherals. But yeah, the fishing rods was a really weird one intended to be used with Sega, Sega bass fishing. But you can actually uh, use it uh, with other games peculiar. I've seen people playing fighting games using the fishing rods, which is really peculiar. 
Um, it kicked off with some games that people absolutely loved from the arcades. Uh, one of which you can see there on top of the stack of discs, Crazy Taxi, which is one of my all-time favourite arcade games. And why I now own an original arcade machine of that. And the sequel, Crazy Taxi High Roller. Um, which was somewhere between Crazy Taxi 2 and 3, I suppose is the way, best way of putting it. Crazy Taxi 2, of course, released for this system, and I have got one on here. So anyway, the Sega Dreamcast, the reason I'm covering it today is not to kind of talk about extensively about its library, and not to kind of talk too much about its history, just giving you a bit of an overview there, but because um, I like to talk about what's going on in the modern world of um, consoles. So say the modern world of retro consoles. Now the modern uh, playing consoles in playing disc based systems in a modern environment is tricky because we're getting to the point now where systems that you know ROM cartridges absolutely fine. You can still play ROM carts that are 20, 30 years old with no problems whatsoever. Uh, the the ROM chips will last a long time, you know, and that they will continue to be played and enjoyed quite easily just keeping the contacts clean on the cartridge is no problem disc based systems however are another kettle of fish now for a couple of years um we've had um things like ever drives appear on the market now ever drives i covered a flash cart for the amstrad gx 4000 the other day i will be doing another video talking about emulation and things in general pretty much tony yeah <laughs> I need to have a cold drink on hand. I've got a bit of a sore throat today as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, and, um, sorry, you're throwing me off a bit. <laughs> disc based systems um, have their own inherent problem in that, uh, besides the convenience uh, of, you know, having to have all the discs available, which is a bit easier than having a load of cartridges available, because obviously discs, uh, disc mechanisms are mechanical and because they have to be fine-tuned and will generally fade over time. Um, the disc-based systems are starting to fail. Also, the build quality of consoles started to, I would say, go down once the arrival of the CD-based systems arrived. Um, now, creating a solution for this uh, has, has not been top priority for everybody, um, mainly because um, a lot of systems could be modified uh, they could be modified back in the day, and it's even easier to do so now. Things like the PS1, the Saturn, uh, the PS2, you know, they had a heavy uh, modding scene, and people created mod chips to be able to use those systems, which allowed you to play discs. Um, unusually for the generation, um, the Dreamcast didn't have an awful lot of copy protection. Copy protection was ignored on some of the, um, well, say, cheaper lesser known CD based consoles back in the day. The Neo Geo CD had no copy protection because copying CDs was hard at the time. The 3DO had no copy protection. The CDI had no copy protection built in. And the problem is, it's very easy to copy games as time moved on for those systems. Great for a retro collector now. However, using C uh, burn CDs on systems with no copy protection can have its drawbacks. Uh, main thing is apparently the lasers have to work harder to be able to read the games. Um, it, you know, it can be a bit hit and miss as to whether backups and things like that will actually work. Um, I do have quite an extensive collection of Dreamcast games. Now the Dreamcast used a proprietary uh, CD storage medium called GD-ROM, which is basically, it's CD, but extended slightly. It's got a range which is much greater than CDs. The thought was that it would be hard to kind of copy because um, CD, you know, CD burners were readily available, but to being able to burn into the ranges that the GD-ROM required and because of um, proprietary code, I think, at the very start, it was very hard, they thought, to be able to, to copy those games. Hackers soon found a way around it using some kind of exploit, I think, that was to do with the way the CD audio worked. And before long, people were, hey, you doing, Rich? You're right. People were ripping the original um, CD. Uh, they were using a certain type of drive, and they were ripping the GD-ROMs, um, and they were compressing them down, removing some content, and then making them fit on a standard 700 megabyte CD, which obviously um, 
it reduced the quality of some of the formation video and things like that. Um, but it allowed you to play copies uh, very easily on these, which pro the piracy probably did contribute some way to Sega's downfall. I'm not a big, uh, I'm not really of the thought too much that um, piracy does harm developer, you know, original developers and system manufacturers quite in the way that they they claim it does. However, you know, that's a topic for another day. I will cover that in another video. But it certainly had an impact, and um, it also had an impact, unfortunately, on the consoles themselves. Now, running copies on the Dreamcast, it was always a noisy drive, it was always a loud system, and it was always a sketchy drive, I found, that would, you know, fail to read original games, it would fail quite quickly, it was noisy, it just didn't sound like a quality drive all along. That's, that's my thoughts, anyway. Um... And using copies, I know from experience, I mean, we do events. I've been through five or six Dreamcasts in the last couple of years. We're getting to that point now, you know, I don't like to put originals out there, even though I do own them, because original games can go missing, they become quite valuable. So I've taken backups of a lot of my collection, and I, instead I put those out at the events, because it makes more sense when they're running for long periods to use the copies, we can allow people the freedom to change games and things like that. I don't see any big problem with that. At the end of the day, when these games aren't for profit anymore. We do, have, we do own the originals of them, and it's just a safer way of putting those games out there for people to just use and enjoy the games. You know, There's, there's no real guilt when it comes to things like that. Um, but unfortunately, it is killing our Dreamcasts, uh, just like the PS1s are dying at an exponential rate, Saturns are failing fast, Dreamcast drives are now failing. So people have been trying to devise for a couple of years, and it's a trickier thing to do, ways of playing these systems um, in a more energy efficient way, a more convenient way, and trying to get some kind of functionality similar to the Everdrives. And so what people have done is they've devised flash-based systems for these consoles that basically re replace the drive mechanism. Now, I've got two Dreamcasts in front of me. Um, I've got, on the left, I've got my formerly main used Dreamcast. It's an original Dreamcast. It's a ver uh, Model 1, VAR1, I think it is, model, which is what all PAL versions were. All PAL versions were capable of reading copies very easily. Apparently, some American versions needed boot discs. Some wouldn't play copies at all, but all PAL versions did, to my knowledge. Um, it, it works okay. It's working fine, um, but it has been used heavily with backups for the last two, three years. So it's starting to take its toll. The drive in this is starting to slow down. You'll notice it will, it will fail to read some copies, and some originals will lag quite a bit. You'll notice the things you used to notice on PS1s with failing lasers back in the day. You will get stuttering FMV, stuttering music, slightly longer load times and things like that. If you take a look inside, you can see the GD-ROM system there. Basically the same hardware-wise as the arcade system. You've got your main board underneath. You've got a power supply which runs down the side. Uh, very compact and efficient a design, actually, the Dreamcast. As, as cheap as it kind of feels... Uh, to the touch, a, a very compact and efficient system, and it was it did well to compact all the arcade hardware into here. The arcade system is probably four to six times the size of this. Um, I know from looking inside my own, um, but the GD ROM system on this, um, it's obviously there. It's not a huge huge system, but it basically sits on top of the um, the console, the the main board of the console itself. Um, obviously it started to fail now, it clunks and grinds and it sits over a hot power supply. You know, they are failing fast and this one will probably give up the ghost eventually. But I will continue to use it as long as I can do and then when the time comes I will be upgrading it. Now what people have come up with, a couple of years ago somebody came up with the, GD, the GDMU. Uh, GDMU used compact flash card, you could basically hack a compact flash card system into it. Uh, and you could um, create a boot disk which would allow you to boot from this compact flash card instead of using disk, but you still need the drive. Um, and you need to modify your case, and you, you'll see a lot of examples online of people where they've had to cut sections out the side or replace the um, network adapter on the side. 
with a section that allows you to use compact flashcards to replace the data on the drives. Um, as time went on, they created a way where you could use, do that completely without needing to use a disc at all. And there's now two main options out there. You've got the GDMU, and there's a new one. Well, say new one. It's been a, a while now, but it's the newer version, and it's called the USB GD-ROM. Now, what that does, it basically, if we take a look inside, you're not going to see it too well, but I have got the shell off, so I'm going to show you in more detail in a minute. You can see inside there, instead of the GD-ROM system, we've got, we've got a usb port at the back there there's actually two usb ports but only the upper one is functional the gd rom laser unit has been removed fully um and we've now just got a usb port at the back there and in there you'll see there's a 128 gigabyte flash drive now like i said there's a couple of these things available now uh, the gdmu uses sd card the USB GD ROM uses a US uses actually just a USB port, which I think is better. Getting a big flash drive is cheaper than getting a big uh, SD card. So uh, if I just lift the lid off this carefully, in fact, it'd be easy to do this. I just lift that off there. You can see inside the Dreamcast, we've got the power supply down the left hand side. Uh, I've got the battery there, which does need to be replaced. That saves the the system date and everything. Uh, you've got the intake fan on the right hand side there. You've got the space where the network adapter clips on the side there And you can see where the GD-ROM laser which I've taken out here I've basically taken the laser assembly out. I've taken the controller board from underneath out Kept that package up because it does actually work on this one. I thought this one was dead I've actually picked up one of my working ones and I've put it into here So what I'll do is I'll transplant that laser system now into my dead one which I've got kicking around at work and this section here entirely comes out with just a couple of screws. And then what I've done is the board itself is about this long and it sits underneath and it's actually got the lid switch built onto it, which operates in a slightly different way from the normal lid switch uh, in that it kind of resets the system, which is like, it's a good way of having kind of a soft system reset because obviously the Dreamcast doesn't feature one. So we've got our USB ports there at the back. It sits underneath this metal shield in here creates a lot more airflow underneath. And then uh, what I've done is I've, on the recommendation of what I've seen online, I've installed it with a bit of tape along the front here. So the intake fan here, um, I think it's the intake fan, it could be the exhaust fan, but either way, the airflow coming from the power supply is channeled more directly along this back section here, uh, where it needs to be. There is one more thing that I need to do. There's a bit of a trade-off in this. The power supply is, are a little bit flaky on Dreamcast. They're nice and compact and easy to replace because you just unscrew a couple of screws and this just lifts off. And a common problem with a lot of Dreamcasts you'll find is they'll, they'll be blinking on and off when you get them. When I got all my Dreamcasts, I got them on a bulk deal, none of them were working properly and they were all doing this blinking thing and people were worried they were gonna blow up, which probably would happen eventually. What actually happens, there's actually a set of pins here with like, they're like sprung inside and this just literally lifts off and there's, there's a bunch of pins there that poke through from the motherboard that actually links the power supply to it. It's not as efficient a plug as it should be. And all I did is you lift this off, you clean the pins with alcohol, you bend the springs forward a bit more. So when you push this power supply back down, it makes better contact with the pins and, and works better. So I've now got three, you know, I've got a bunch of working Dreamcasts uh, however, now the lasers are failing, so that's the weak spot. Uh, using the GD, using the uh, USB GD ROM instead of the proper GD ROM disk drive, uh, what you're left with is a live 12 volt rail that isn't being used by the mechanism of the disk drive. And what tends to happen is the heat buildup over here be, tends to be quite large. It won't matter for the sake of me doing this video, but it will matter in the long term. So what people have found there's, there's ways to do. You can eliminate the 12 volt, um, the, the I think it's the 12 volt resistor that's in here. You can basically remove that from the system completely. You can add a 300 ohm resistor, which I actually put a call out on my page for people to send me, and is now on its way, and I'm gonna try that first, because it's the cheapest way to do it, and bridge a couple of pins here, 
and that will absorb the 12 volt voltage and dissipate it in a controllable heat way without frying your capacitors inside here. Uh, there is a third way which I will probably go down eventually and that is to replace this, this power supply unit with a modern Pico power supply unit. There's actually one being made dedicated for the Dreamcast called Dream PSU but it's like 40 quid with the shipping and you've then got also got to buy an external power supply that's own power brick. It'll be more energy efficient, more heat efficient and everything and I probably will go down that route, route eventually but for now I'm fine with this and I will use a resistor just to eliminate the heat and just test using this system. As I've mentioned, what I've already done, you can actually just plug the USB GD-ROM board onto the connector, which is along this side, just slot it on, but it kind of flaps loose and the circuit board's exposed, it's not really nice. You can buy a custom shell, which uh, it's a 3D printed shell online, which encloses this space completely and allows you easy access just to the USB connection there. What I've done is the recommendations on the USB GD-ROM site. You obviously, it's been designed to fit in the stock place, so we've still got the lid switch there. The um, the USB port pokes through where the ribbon cable used to come up for the GD-ROM connector there. I've just basically housed it on the bottom of this. It's got screw holes to allow you to do so. Keeps it nice and neat. It, it, it insulates the inside when you open the, open the lid and it just creates a nice easy access section there for the USB ports. I've got my super compact integral um, SD, uh, sorry, USB drive here, 128 gigabytes, quite a big one. That is big enough for about 50% of the um, of the uh, Dreamcast library, which is plenty. You don't want all the games, you know, you probably want most of them. Some of them you don't care about, you don't bother about the regional variations. But it's nice and compact, it's really hard wearing. I've left one of these out in um, a wet puddle overnight accidentally come back to it in the following day still absolutely fine um i'm not going to say how that happened or why but it did so anyway you can actually do this with the lid on but it's easier this way and what i've done is i've just attached a cable tie on there which makes retrieval a bit easier from inside the system if i need to plug it out i've already prepped the drive prepping the drive is easy it has to be formatted in fat32 which can be a bit of a problem if you're doing it with a, such a large usb drive as i as i am doing um, but I found a tool to do it, so that's formatted in FAT32 with 64 kilobyte clusters. Uh, you drop on one file, which is a launch ISO. And what happens is when you first start it up, you'll get the normal Dreamcast loading screens and it will load, you'll be able to load straight into the menu. At least you will do when you've got a BIOS battery that's working. I'll be replacing that um, in a couple of days but you need to peel that off and solder a new one on so i'll be doing that um, because it's about time i did it on all of them and i might as well do it while i've got this one taken apart when i start this one in a minute it'll probably ask me to set the date and time and i'll have to launch it like you'd launch a disc but anyway it's ready to go so i'm just going to pop the lid back on just pop it on loosely i can screw it back on in a little while let's try and do this carefully the alignment is kind of perfect, so there we go. Pop that back on, and it doesn't matter whether you've got the lid up or the lid down, but when the lid's down, it does engage that lid switch there. And you can see obviously the old casing from the GD ROM laser unit there is contained nicely. So we'll shut that down. I'll just pop my TV back out of standby because it went to standby while I was yakking away. Give it a second to come on. Like I say, I apologise for the shakiness. My gimbal's decided it doesn't want to work properly today. In fact, I'll set this down on this little holder here just while I show you what's going on because it'll be better than my shaky hands. So, a second, let's set this up a bit. There we go. And if I hit the power button on the console now, you can still hear the system fan, but you haven't got a horrible drive grinding away like you normally would have on the Dreamcast. Yeah, see, so it's asking me about the uh, setting the date and time. Like I say, when I replace the battery, it won't do that. It will just load as it would load a normal disc. No point setting it because it'll just reset itself. And 
and like I say, normally it would just load like a normal disc would straight into the menu, but because I've had to set the date, you have to keep play. And when it loads, it will load just like a disc does. You get the Dreamcast logo, and then it will flick over to the Sega logo and into the menu. Now this menu might look a bit strange to people who've seen uh, other footage of the USGD ROM before. This is actually using the latest um, firmware for this system. It had the original firmware on there when I got it. I bought it off my friend Gareth, who I think is now watching. He was curious to see what this looked like when it was all in. I've got it all working, it's easy enough to fit. Um, it differs slightly from the GDMU. The GDMU device now has got a really nice, cool graphical interface, a bit like a front-end system if you've got like an emulator-based arcade. Um, it's got, um, you've got like a cover flow thing going on with all the titles and you can pick your game from that. This is a lot more basic, but it's, how's it going Gareth? I knew you was there somewhere, mate. I've updated the firmware now, and you can probably just see at the top there, the latest firmware date, 18th of April 2018. It was on a 2017 uh, firmware, which has got a blue background with yellow writing. People asked them to change it to a black background with green writing. Um, I don't think it looks better, to be honest. It probably is clearer on some CRTs, because CRTs, you get like artifacting and, and blur at the edges, but... Uh, it probably is a bit clearer actually on an LCD screen and it does make it more akin to you know Crix's line of Everdrives for the the standard cartridge based console so you know it works at the end of the day now you're presented with this system um, and uh, you've got system volume information you can't actually look at that which is pointless um, I'm glad I updated the firmware because the loading times are improved as a result of it you, there was a kind of weird um, blurring artifacting thing going on at the top on the old firmware. Now I've updated that, that's completely gone. So it's a lot more stable image. It might look a bit wavy on here, that's probably because I've got the contrast up a bit too high on the TV. But it's actually a very stable image here. Uh, and I've loaded it up with a load of games, basically the same kind of things I've got on my uh, emulation arcade. It will read CDI format, which is basically the ones that have been ripped from GDI and made fit on a CD. Um, it will read the original GDI rips as well, straight from disc. Uh, although having that, that system on here is a bit messier because then you'll, you have to have a folder for each game. You have to find the, the GDI Q file and then you've got loads of like other files. I'd rather have the CDI format like this. It's one file per game, easy to organize your games. Um, as standard, the firmware tries to make you categorize it into individual letters and I can't be arsed with that, there's no point. You can skip down the list fast enough anyway. I just want one list, one set of games with everything I need. Um, yeah, no problem, Jace. Basically, um, the GDMU, th th this this is where the problem comes. The GDMU, which is, which is created by the same person who creates the similar system for the Saturn, um, there's a big problem with waiting times. They're only doing them in extremely limited batches. You have to wait for the announcement and then you have to jump on and get it made. GDMU, which is the alternative to this, is the cheaper one and I think it's £110, I think it is, to order a GDMU. Could be £120. Um, this, the USB, G, sorry, the USB GDMU, this is the better one, apparently. Um, and I think it's great. Um, it's a, it's about £160, I think, which is not cheap. Um, I'll post links following this video once I'm done. Um, it's not cheap by any means. And, you know, you can pick up a Dreamcast for 30 quid now, a decent Dreamcast. Uh, and you're going to be doing this generally on a Dreamcast that's got a busted, you know, CD drive. So it's a lot of money to invest in these. I got this cheap, thankfully, off Gareth. Um, he done me a great deal on it. Um, else I would have been waiting a while to get one made yeah they are made to order but they are a great device and pretty soon everybody's going to be having to do this on all their disk space systems all of the disk replacement flash solutions like this at the moment I don't think the hardware that's going into them particularly costs that much 
um, but they are profiting because they know a lot more people are going for these now. They're needing to have these, whereas Everdrives are kind of optional. Um, and right now the prices are pretty high. They may come down in time as more devices are created. But yeah, you're looking about £170 for this normally, um, straight from the website. But it, it, it's worth every penny when you consider it rescues your system and you get to play original hardware. And, you know, as much as you can go with your copied discs, you know, that will just wear out your laser faster. All you're doing is delaying the inevitable, you know. That's the cheapest way to, to kind of do um, Dreamcast gaming these days, but pretty soon it's going to die. You're going to need the, these systems. So I've loaded up with a load of games. Um, it will handle single file games. It will handle multi-system games very easily. I'll show you that's done in a minute. You'll see some options at the bottom here. Auto launch GDI images. Um, you can change that. I'm not quite sure what that means. I think you can set it one to load automatically. And there's also a region free switch on the bottom anyway. Generally, the CDI rips were, you know, made region free anyway when people were making those. So you've not really got a problem with that. And there's also another option at the bottom which says select image for swap. What you can actually do is you can swap, um, you can use like the Game Shark or the Action Repo, something like that. You can basically inject that code before you launch a disc. Uh, which is quite cool, so it does support all the peripherals and, and things like that. But um, I've just loaded it with a load of games here. Most of the games you've seen before, but you'll see the load times are a lot faster. The system's a lot quieter. You're not hearing a horrible grinding mechanism going away. So we'll fire up Crazy Taxi first of all. Good game to start with. And then it kind of goes straight into the process. It would do as if it was loading an original disc. Like I say, you've got no horrible grinding noise, the loading is smooth, goes straight into the game, and it, the loading time is a lot faster. I was actually comparing it last night, and um, yeah, it, it, it's definitely a lot better. It's a lot faster, you don't get skipping, you don't get delays on the draw distance. Like we, when the lasers start to fail, the draw distance on games like Crazy Taxi, because it moves so fast, suffers and on here it keeps up perfectly Gus was always the best his car stops the fastest <laughs> Crazy Taxi, just such a fantastic game. Prefer to play on the PS2 if I'm honest, but soundtrack just makes it. And you'll notice the draw distance in the background is currently perfect. It's drawing at the correct distance it should do. When your laser starts to fail on this game, when your laser starts to fail on this game, you'll find it will fail to draw parts of the background. It'll fail to draw characters and it'll go really weird. On my other uh, system that I've got here, I, pl I was playing a slightly scratched disc with this game yesterday, and uh, the laser is starting to fail on that. And uh, when I was playing this, parts of the background would just disappear. So, you know, the, the evidence for failing drives is right there. And you need to do something about it now if you want to continue to play these systems. And that's exactly what these systems were created for. So anyway, that's Crazy Taxi, you know Crazy Taxi. Now, obviously, I'll mention that they've got the lid switch in there. Obviously the Dreamcast had no hard reset, you just got power and eject. So the lid switch, they've changed on this. So when you hit lid switch, it will act similar to it would have done when you opened the disk drive when playing a normal game. And then you can just pop that back down, hit play, don't need to change anything, and it will just load straight back into the menu as it did before. It also means you can queue up games to automatic, you can set it up so it will automatically launch the next 
uh, CD in the sequence, like on games like Shenmue or uh, Alone in the Dark, as you saw on the menu there. I haven't got that far in any of those games, and I haven't got it, um, the um, save pack in there at the moment to be able to do that. The VMU, couldn't remember the name of it then. I haven't got the VMU to be able to save the game and show you that, but it does work. It will, you'll get to the end of the disc, you'll open that up, you'll change it, and you'll be able to load the next one in the sequence. So, yeah, so, so yeah, the USB GDMU, totally worth the money, kind of pricey at the moment, but definitely needed. You know, everybody's going to need to go for these eventually. Uh, as soon as I get my hands on them and I'm able to order one, I'll be covering the rear for the Saturn. Uh, because my Saturn drives are now failing, even though I had those chipped and I was able to play copy games, those drives are now failing. Uh, there's one being developed for the PlayStation, which is eagerly awaited, but it's a problem at the moment because it, you can only use it uh, on the first model PS1s with the serial port at the back, and you still need to do a hardware mod to use them. It's not 100% compatible, um, but there are people developing them for pretty much every um, every CD-based system out there. The same people who made the USB GD-ROM have also developed one for the uh, 3DO, which works in exactly the same way. It's kind of pricey, but I will be getting that soon because my 3DO disk drive is failing. Um, and there's people working on them for all of the CD-based systems. I think there's one being worked on for the CDI. Uh, there's probably one being worked on for the Jaguar. In fact, the Jaguar CD, they're working on uh, a flash cart for the Jaguar because one doesn't exist yet. That will actually emulate the CD on there. Um, I've got a PC Engine now, and because the, the, the failure rate of the CD systems for the PC Engine, uh, they've created an entire new add-on that attaches to it that will emulate the full CD system. So you don't even need to buy the CD system for that. So there's people out there working on these solutions, and it's cool that they are. And um, thankfully now, I've got a CD working uh, dream sorry gd rom working uh, dreamcast unit and i've now got a fully modded one this will make playing games myself and using it things like events a lot simpler and um yeah i think it's going to be the way forward for everybody who, who owns cd based systems so that was my video on the sega dreamcast and the usb gd rom my dinner's just arrived so i'm going to sign off now and i'll be back with another video later this week I've got two more exciting consoles in a bag down there, not looking too pretty at the moment, that I want to talk about. And uh, I hope you continue to share my videos, like and stay subscribed, and I'll, um, I'll check you later this week.